Um, so welcome to our MIT star is equal to RE uh, seminar at the Hebrew University. Um, my name is Michael Chapman. Uh, I'm one of the organizers of the seminar together with Professor uh, Alex Lubotsky and Professor Nati Liniel. Um, I want to uh, do to say some uh, things before I start today's talk. Um, so I'll, I'll start from the main goal of the seminar. So the main is goal is to really understand the proof of MIP stars equal to RE up to the, and also its consequences up to the details. So we will dive quite deep into all the details of the proof throughout the seminar. But to do that, we need first to um, have some background, have do some introductions and so on. There are probably better lectures for introduction talk uh, to this topic. Uh, and I added some links to very good talks uh, on YouTube uh, that if any one of you wants to see and hear, you can go there. So in my website, I uh, will send also some links through the email. Um, and that's it. Uh, I'll say another uh, technical thing is that uh, we are in, intersecting both with uh, Kashdan's uh, seminar and with the uh, vacations that like, it's the day off, not in Israel, Sunday. So uh, we will probably send other option for time slots for this seminar after this talk. And if you will be kind enough to fill them up and then we will choose whether we move the hour of the seminar to another uh, time slot, that will be great. Uh, okay, so I think I'll start unless someone has some question or remark that he wants to say before. No, great. Um, okay, so what the plan is for the first two talks. So these, as I said, introductory talks. Um, so we first are going to talk about correlations, games and lower bounding the complexity class MIP star. And afterwards, uh, I will talk about Cyrilson's problem and its relation to MIP star. Probably this will be the part of the talk that we will uh, be able to cover this week. And next week we will talk about cones embedding problem. And I will outline uh, the main ingredients of the proof of MIP star is equal to R. Um, great. Okay. So, uh, Let's talk first about some okay. the three problems. Hmm? Uh, so as I wrote, the name of the lecture is three problems. So I just want to say what are the problems. So first of all, there's cones embedding problem, which is uh, a problem in uh, operator algebras. Okay, so operator algebras for Neumann algebras, functional analysis uh, from about 78, say 78-ish. Which discusses the way of approximating uh, algebras using uh, finite dimensional matrices. So it's some question about approximating, approximating an algebraic structure uh, using finite matrices. Um, the second problem that we are going to talk about is Tillerson's problem. This is a problem in foundations of quantum mechanics. So foundations of quantum mechanics, okay. Uh, and what is foundations of quantum mechanics? It's a fancy way of saying, uh, what is the correct mathematical model uh, that explains some me uh, quantum mechanical phenomenon? Okay, so there are several models and the question is, uh, what are the differences between the models mathematically? Okay, and this is from the early 90s. And lastly, the third uh, problem that we will talk about uh, is whether every language in every uh, problem inside the complexity class MIP star uh, is computable, decidable, okay? And uh, this is from about around 2004. Okay, and this is in complexity theory. Complexity theory. 
So it seems as if uh, each one of these questions lives inside uh, a different place. So this is like cones embedding is pure mathematics, algebra, uh, operator algebras and so on. Tillerson's problem is modeling quantum mechanics. Uh, it's mathematical models to quantum mechanics and a uh, complexity theory is from computer science. So uh, what are the relations? So uh, in the last 10 years, okay, so about 10 years ago, uh, it was shown that Cohn's embedding problem is uh, equivalent to what we call Tillerson's problem. So I will mention what exactly I mean by Tillerson's problem in this talk and next talk probably what I mean by Cohn's embedding problem. And they were shown uh, about 10 years ago to be equivalent. And, and the interesting relation to the complexity theory is that, and we will see today that if Tillerson's problem is uh, true, you can deduce that every problem in MIP star is actually computable. And this is from 2008. So this is 2008, this is about 2010. Okay, so I'll... Uh, just going through that. Okay, so we will start from the right, the most right-hand problem and then uh, proceed on. Great, so bounding MIP star. Uh, to talk about MIP star, we need to talk about what are correlations. So I'm just saying beforehand that this part of the talk is based on uh, the YouTube talk of Henry Yuan. Uh, he gave a talk at the IAS uh, a few months ago and I'm using some of his uh, methodology and pedag pedagogical ideas. Um, okay, so what are correlations? So we should think of two boxes, okay? We have a box A and a box B. Okay, so here's A, here's B. And uh, each box gets an input out, to, out of uh, a finite uh, set of inputs. So box A has a finite set of inputs, of possible inputs. Box B has a finite set of possible inputs and then each one gets an input and they need to produce somehow an output. Okay, so this is this small a and small b. And again, also the outputs come from uh, some fixed, uh, uh, like fixed beforehand uh, set of finite possibilities. Great. Now the input output behavior of these boxes uh, can be described by a conditional probability, given that the boxes were asked X and Y, what is the probability that they will answer A and B? So this is a conditional probability distribution and we call such condi conditional uh, probability distributions correlations. So this is this P object that lives here. And uh, the set of all such correlations is living in some Euclidean space. So uh, these are just function form some finite set to R. So this lives in R to the some power, finite power. So we can think of uh, this set as some, uh, it lives inside the unit cube, for example, inside this uh, high dimensional uh, Euclidean space. And the main question is how do the boxes generate their correlation? So what is the rules for the boxes to generate uh, this probability uh, distribution? Okay, so the first uh, rule, which is not the best one is if they can uh, signal each other. So if they can communicate. So uh, if after they got their questions, after uh, A received the question X and B received question Y, they can call one another and say, hi, I received question X, hi, I received question Y and so on. And also if they can share randomness beforehand. So for example, they can uh, generate dice and each face of the die uh, has some probability and they can uh, manipulate this and design the dice, dice such that this probability is anything uh, you want, uh, then they, they can generate any correlation. So any uh, element inside speed they can generate. Okay, so in some sense, this is the boring situation. And usually when we talk about correlation, we talk about the no, no signaling case. So there is no communication a posteriori. So after they get their question, uh, they cannot communicate. They can uh, only use the information they have now and maybe do some physical things to uh, inside the boxes. Uh, and there is a way to uh, uh, mathematically model what does it mean to be non-communicating, but this is not important for us. The main thing is that you get strict subsets of the set of all correlations. 
great. Um, now, the easiest way of thinking uh, of what is the easiest way of them to co to do something? So how, how can they answer in the most easiest way? So they can meet beforehand, box A and box B, and they can decide on functions, uh, a function for box A that for every input gives an output and a function for box B that for every input gives an output. And then they will just answer according to their question. So if uh, box A got an X, it will always answer the A of X. And if box B got a uh, question Y, it will always answer uh, DB of Y. And the set of all correlations that look like this, that are generated using this, uh, this method are called deterministic. Okay, so this is quite clear. They are determined, they are predetermined. There's no randomness here. There's no uh, several option. Uh, these are just Dirac measures uh, for any uh, que question pair X and Y. Now the uh, classical correlations uh, are the convex hull of the deterministic ones. So uh, using randomness, okay, so where, where does the name classical correlations come from? So if you model your world without quantum mechanics and you believe that your world is only uh, classical, uh, then uh, there is no correlation without information, okay? So the only way that they can correlate better is if they share some information. And because the only information that they can share is before they get their questions, uh, they can only use randomness uh, and this uh, deterministic approach and together they get uh, the convex hull of the deterministic approach, okay? So if they can share randomness beforehand, this is the maximum that they can get correlation wise. Okay, great. Any questions up till now? So uh, I, I will just say that Alon is managing the, the chat. So if you have any questions, you can also ask in chat and maybe Alon will answer you. Uh, so you, you can use this method as well. Great, but um, since the beginning of the 1920s, uh, the, the 90s, the, the 19th century, okay, 20th century, okay, 1900s. Since the beginning of the 1900s, um, we believe that our world is not governed by classical mechanics, rather by uh, quantum mechanics. And we will have some more rigorous introduction into quantum mechanics and modeling quantum mechanics sometimes, sometime in this seminar. Um, but for now, you can just take it as some model. I will try to experiment to explain where this model comes from. So why this is the way we think of modeling quantum mechanics, but uh, since we don't have the language, uh, we will. you can just take it as it is, as some mathematical model of a way of correlating. So now instead beforehand, they just roll, roll some dice before they uh, went along uh, alone and using the dice and the predetermined uh, uh, functions that they chose, they uh, answer their answers. Now we think of the following uh, thing. So box A gets some question X, box B gets some question Y, and they, then they conduct some experiments. So you should think of the boxes as some labs with, an, with equipment and inside these boxes and with the labs and the equipment, they can do some measurements. They can measure things, uh, physical things. And the thing that they share beforehand is some uh, uh, particles that uh, are entangled. And I will not say what entanglement actually means, but the fact that they can share beforehand some physical things uh, that are entangled enables them to correlate without any communication, okay? And the way, the way we model it is as follows. So uh, we have two Hilbert spaces. So for at least for now, these Hilbert spaces are finite dimensional. So these are just uh, uh, the complex numbers to some power. So complex number to the A and complex number to the B. And they share beforehand some Psi in the tensor product of a, H, A, and H, B, so in C to the A, C to the D, B. If you don't know what the tensor product is, okay, so I'll just give you an example uh, of the Kronecker tensor product. Okay, so the tensor product of uh, one, two with three, four, five uh, is one times three, one times four, one times five, two times three, 
two times four, two times five. So you get the vector space whose dimension is the uh, product of the two uh, dimensions of the spaces, and you just multiply each coordinate uh, from the two vectors. Okay, so uh, you can think of a vector that lives inside the span of all such vectors, and this is called uh, an element in the tensor product. And the way we think of these HA and HB are the state of our system. Okay, so H and HB are all the possible uh, conditions in which our system can be. So the easiest way of thinking about it is, for example, that R3 is modeling a position in three-dimensional space, right? So any point, any potential point that uh, a particle can be in three-dimensional space can be modeled using R3, okay? So uh, you should think of a C to the DA tensor C to the BDB as the, uh, as the space of all possible pos uh, conditions in which our system can be, great. And Psi is the actual state, actual state of our system. Great. And you should note that we, uh, we ask that this is a unit vector. So actually only the unit vectors are the one required to uh, describe the whole condition of our system. Okay, great. So this is the first thing that they share. This is the way I think of the uh, quantum, the entangled particle, the particles that they share beforehand. Okay, great. Now I need to tell you what does it mean that they do an experiment. So I said that for any question, they conduct some experiment inside their boxes. Uh, so the way we model some, an experiment is the following. Uh, so for any question, okay, so this is for any question, I take a sequence of posi positive matrices that sum up to the identity, okay? And uh, these matrices uh, are modeling the uh, way we conduct our experiment, okay? So the experiment and the matrices uh, have the same information in the sense of what the possible correlations that can occur. Um, when these are projection matrices, maybe it's easier to understand why, those of you who learned quantum mechanics, uh, when these are only positive matrices, it's maybe a bit confusing, uh, but this is very similar to just taking a probability measure, right? What is a probability measure? A probability measure is a sequence of positive or non-negative numbers that sum up to one. So here, instead of taking non-negative numbers, we take non-negative matrices that sum up to one. Uh, what is just uh, a positive matrix? So MAX uh, is self-adjoint and all its eigenvalues are positive. So for now, for now this is enough for me, non-negative, non-negative. Okay, so now we have, a, what does it mean to uh, conduct an experiment? And we yes, need to say- just to, make sure, just to make sure when you say positive, you mean positive definite, right? Or no negative definite, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so a positive operator, uh, usually in functional analysis. And I'll rem I'll, later I will state the more uh, correct way of defining this uh, object, but- for now on, you just need to think of uh, self-adjoint matrices with non-negative eigenvalues that sum up to the identity. Now I need to tell you what is the connection between the state of our current system. So uh, if you believe that uh, there is some particle at some position in R3, you can, uh, in classical mechanics, you just can check what is the position of this particle. Um, but in quantum mechanics, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit different. Um, when you choose a measurement, there are several possible outcomes. This is the basis for this measurement. And any uh, outcome is only from this basis of measurements. And the probability that we get at each outcome uh, is uh, defined using some inner product. So you take this specific condition, like the state of the system now, okay, I'll write it here. So you take the state of the system, you take the uh, matrix that is, uh, related to the answer A, you multiply it by this state, you take their inner product, and this is the probability of getting A. 
and this is G of getting A. Great, so uh, this is an experiment. Well, and now hold, we on, mix oh, oh, hold on, but Psi is a, is a vector in dA times dB space. And you are MA right, I'm, I'm a bit cheating. It's a matrix now I think in of... a, a by A matrix. Yeah, you are right, Alex. So now let's think that the, st the state of our system was only inside H of A. Okay, so uh, th this is what happens if I only look think about a world where everything lives inside H of A, which is the same. Okay, so at least in our case, it's not the same, but uh, you can just think of this thing. Okay, so t take the identity at the right uh, coordinate and you will get uh, the probability. Okay, great. So we now modeled an experiment. So for any question, we have an, an experiment. So a sequence of matrices and also B. So also the box B has some uh, experiment for every question. And now the correlation that we get, if A is conducting its experiment and B is conducting its experiment, uh, the probability that their outcomes will be A and B given that they the questions were X and Y. So they are conducting experiment X and experiment Y is exactly this, uh, this amount. And you can interpret this amount also in the following way. So I'll write it down as I wrote downstairs. You take the tensor product of these two matrices, you apply it on Psi and you take the inner product with Psi. Okay, so you can check that uh, since MAX were uh, positive operators, positive matrices, and NBY were positive matrices. Their tensor product is also a positive matrix. So this definition is preserved under the conical tensor product. And so the inner product of acting with uh, this matrix on C and then taking uh, the inner product with C, okay? So taking the product of MAX tensor NBY with C and uh, taking the inner product with C uh, is a non-negative number. So uh, this uh, is an easy check. Hmm? Michael, since, yes. I, I, since there are questions about this, maybe I can say something which I think is a simpler representation of what you're saying. Ah, right. it, maybe, maybe too simplified, but you will tell me if it's, if it's too much. Uh, so I think for, for this purpose, we can think of the following. So Psi, is just a vector in the tensor product of HA and HB. Right. And now what uh, Alice and Bob, what these boxes do is each of them picks a, a, a basis, an autonormal basis for uh, their own space. So A picks an autonormal basis for HA and B picks an autonormal basis for HB. Now Guy, have... I will stop you just for a moment. This basis depends on the question. Okay, so for every question, they choose. Right, the yes, yeah. They first get a question. Right, you're right. They, f they first get a question, then they pick a basis based on that question, but each picks their own basis alone. But then by some magic, what they can do is, although each of them only knows one basis, they somehow physics for them generates the tensor product of those two bases. Uh, and then, uh, and then Psi is somehow uh, written in this tensor product of bases because Psi is in the tensor product of the spaces. So you get Psi as a linear combination of the tensor products of the bases that they chose. And then the result is, uh, is taking like the, the element, uh, I don't know. The coefficient B, of the specific uh, projection. Like right. if B is a base element in, oh, sorry, if A is a uh, base element in HA and B is a base element in HB and Psi has coefficient alpha for A times B, then you get a for then A answers A and B answers B with probability that is alpha squared. Yeah, this is true. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you, Guy. This this is a good a, a good explanation. Uh, 
the only problem with this explanation is that this is using projectors. So this is the case where uh, all these matrices are projection matrices. Yes. And this, this is not an actual problem, but uh, uh, at least so I, I wanted to just state a, a, a bit more general thing. Um, at least in this case, I think it's more or less without loss of generality, am I? Uh, you get the same correlation set if you restrict yes. yourself to pro only projections. This is true. Yeah. Okay, and we will talk about it uh, uh, along the seminar. So uh, this will be important, Steinmark's dilation theorem. So, okay, anyway, uh, thanks, uh, Guy. So we now we get, the, the point is, okay, so this is some model of generating probability, conditional probability measures. So now we get uh, this CQ, okay? So this curly CQ. And again, it lives in R to the OA, OB, IA, IB. So now th this is the main point I want you to think about. We get a potentially larger set, okay? Inside this uh, Euclidean space. And uh, it is a famous question of uh, Einstein, Fodolsky and Rosa and whether these are the same sets. So whether actually this model gives you a larger set of correlations or whether any such correlation can be modeled using uh, classical mechanics. And uh, Bell gave the answer that this is not true. So these are uh, genuinely uh, different sets. There are more elements inside the quantum correlation. So there are more conditional distributions uh, that can be generated using this method than using the, uh, determinist, the convex hull of the deterministic ones. Uh, okay, so now I want to uh, explain at least how one should try to attack such a question. So uh, what, what are the ways that you can uh, go and do that? So, okay, maybe I'll go first and look at these things. So this is a convex set and this is a convex set. And usually when you want to uh, distinguish between two convex sets, you just find a functional that distinguishes between them. There is a hypersurface that distinguishes between these two uh, uh, sets. And this is our uh, goal now. We want to generate some uh, functional that separates these two sets. Okay, so the way we generate these uh, uh, functionals is that we think of uh, some game that is played uh, with these boxes. So let's define what a game is. A, a two player one round game uh, is just a tuple with the following data. Uh, it consists of four finite sets. These are, these are exa exactly the input and output sets for the boxes. Uh, it consists of a probability distribution over the pair of questions. So mu is uh, the way I sample questions, okay? Uh, and V is the decision function. So for any uh, sequence of questions and answers, uh, I need to tell you beforehand whether this is a winning condition or a losing condition. So this is our winning predicate. Uh, and we think of a referee that rolls some dice and uh, using the results of the dice send questions X and Y to A and B and then the boxes do what they do. They correlate in the way they want to correlate. They answer questions, uh, answers A and B. And the referee decides uh, using this uh, predetermined function whether they won or lost. So up until now, this is just uh, a simple thing. The point is that for any such game and any, and any correlation, uh, you can define the value of this game using this correlation. So uh, this value is just the winning probability in this game. So given that you use uh, a specific correlation, there is some winning probability. So let's check that this is ex exactly the winning probability of the game. Oh, I didn't want that. Anyway, okay, so. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, can so, you go back for a second for the previous slides? I didn't understand how do you define P in this case? Ah, there is, is no P here. There is no but P, Alex. The, but there is uh, P there in is the next one. There is only a game. 
No, okay, so you, you understand what a game is? It's just uh, so, uh, deciding whether a tuple wins or not and uh, some what, what do you mean decide? What do you mean deciding? Who decides? So the game the referee. decided. What? The referee. The referee is part of the information of the game. Alex, in yeah, this okay, slide. so you see that the, this, in, this, this decision function, you have here a decision function. This is part of the information of the game. And this is deciding, this function decides whether this is a winning or losing condition. For and every, so this is just a function from the four tuple A, a X, Y, A, B to zero, one. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's what yeah. you call referee, okay. The referee also is the probability distribution beforehand. You, you need to uh, sample some questions. Okay. So the referee samples questions and decides whether this is a winning condition or a losing condition. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't necessarily need to be the same person, but uh, there is... Yeah, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> mu, defines, but, mu defines a probability measure over the questions and V gets the questions and the answers and tell you if the players won or if they lost. Don't have to be personal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is just a personalized uh, way of thinking of it, but you don't have to have a single referee. Um, okay, great. So the point is that uh, now we can take a pair. Now, Alex, we don't have just a game or just a correlation. We take a specific game and a specific correlation and we want to check whether if, okay, the question is as follows. If we play this game and the boxes uses, use this specific uh, correlation, what is the probability of winning? So uh, this is just uh, this number that appears here. So mu x, y is just the probability that did you, the referee will- Did you define will what winning is? What is winning here? Getting one. But who gets one, A or B? I mean- They, they play together. They are ah, both okay. playing. Oh. against the referee or with the, I don't know, it's, it's not a, it's so against, but. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a game against see that, nature. Nature defines yeah. this uh, mu probability, the probability of our questions. Alice and Bob both get each one's uh, question and they choose answers to the best of their abilities. And then V decides if they live or if they die uh, okay. based on the questions and the answers. And they want to live, so. Uh, for now, they don't want to live. They just want to correlate in some way, but later they will want to live. Uh, okay, so um, let's just look again at, on this, uh, uh, this uh, mathematical uh, 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 thing. Okay, so here mu of x, y is the probability that actually the referee will x, ask x and y. P of a, b given x, y is just the probability that they will answer a and b given that they were asked x and y. So this is just the probability that we will get the tuple X, Y, A, B. And then you just give, give them a one if this is a winning condition and give them a zero if this is a losing condition. So this is exactly uh, the winning probability in this game using this correlation. And the point is that this is a linear functional. So this is a linear functional on R to the O, A, O, B, I, A, I, B, okay? And, uh, this potentially can distinguish between correlation sets. So now I want to demonstrate the, the uh, CHSH game. Okay, so um, in the CHSH game, all questions and all answers are just single bits. So IA is IB is OA is OB is just the set of zero and one. The question distribution is uniform. So the referee just flips two coins uh, and according to these coins send a zero and a one, whether the, it was heads or tails or something. And uh, the interesting thing about the CHSH game is what is the uh, winning predicate? So given the tuple X, Y, A, B, uh, the players win if and only if the product of the questions is equal to the sum of the answers. And since we live in uh, F2, so this is the field with two elements, everything is modulo two. Okay, so this is a very simple game, uniform distribution, only bits are questions, the questions and answers are both just bits. And uh, this winning predicate is again, quite uh, easy to understand. So I'll say it in, 
uh, in English, uh, they need to agree on their answer if either of them got a zero and they need to disagree if both of them got a one. And the question is, what is the maximum success probability in this game? And the interesting thing is that it depends on your model. So if you are living in a classical world, uh, you have a different maximum success probability than if you live in a, a quantum world. And this is the point of uh, Bell's result. Uh, so what Bell showed, and I also the name CHSH is from Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, and Hall. Um, so they showed that for on the one hand, the for any classical correlation, so for any question that comes from the convex hull of the deterministic correlation, uh, the maximum probability is, is the probability that you win is bounded by 75%. Okay, so this is quite easy to understand. Um, the classical correlations are a polytope with a finite number of uh, vertices, and you took the convex hull, and this is a linear functional. So the maximum value is uh, uh, achieved on one of the vertices. So there are only 16 vertices that we need to check. So this is just checking 16 conditions and seeing that all of them are smaller or equal to 0.75. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can show that there exists some uh, quantum correlation for which the value of this game, the probability uh, of winning in this game is strictly larger than 0.75. Specifically, it's one half plus one over two square root of two. So again, when um, you say exist a quantum correlation, you mean there exist matrices and blah, blah, blah. Exactly, exactly. There, are, there exist. Okay, so let's, let's check how many matrices. So for any A and any X, there is an MAX, right? And for any B and any Y, there is an NBY. Okay. And there are these conditions, right? So we need that M0, 0 plus M1, 0 is equal to the identity on HA. And we need that M01 plus M11 is equal to the identity on HA and so on and so forth. Okay. So uh, we, we need to take this model that we talked about beforehand. And actually this specific correlation comes from, okay, so we had HA, which was C to the DA and HB, which was C to the DB. So you can take this DA to be two and this DB to be two. Okay, so uh, may you, a priori you could think that maybe you need a higher dimensional spaces for this uh, thing, but you need only two dimensional spaces for each of the players, for each of the boxes. Okay, so an automatic, okay, so as we said before, uh, this distinguishes between these two convex sets. Uh, so CQ is not the same as uh, CC. Um, but can we uh, draw an even, uh, like further results from uh, this game? And, uh, the further results that I want to ask is whether this is actually the best we can get. Okay, does, okay, so my uh, iPad stopped uh, communicating. So just a moment. Great. So uh, the question is whether uh, this is the supremum over all quantum uh, correlations. Uh, so this is a question you can ask. Is there a better quantum correlation that we can use? Maybe if I use 10, uh, 10 dimensional spaces or uh, 1 million dimensional spaces, uh, we will get better and better values of this game. So uh, Cyril Stone showed in the 80s that this is not correct. So actually the supremum over all, uh, the, all the values when you run over all quantum correlations is this number one half plus one over two square root of two. And and a straightforward corollary from that is that actually the quantum correlations are not all of the correlations. And you can check that you can define a correlation just that if they can communicate, you can define a correlation which gets, which wins 100% of the time uh, with value one. Uh, so this shows that the set of quantum correlations is not the set of all correlations. Okay, nice. 
Michael, you yes. said before that uh, the correlation set in the classical cases is, uh, is a polytope with 16 vertices, right? Uh, at least in the case where the answers and questions are only two, uh, yeah, are only bits, right? Yeah, in this right? particular case, do we know what the, the correlation set uh, looks like in the quantum case? Ah, th this is the question, this is Tirelson's question, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, try to understand how these sets behave, okay? So, no, even uh, in this particular case, do we know? Uh, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Like you, you said, whether you, you ask whether in the two-dimensional case, we can approximate it using an epsilon net. No, I understand, but even, you know, very simple things. It's a convex set. Is it a polytope? Is it? No, it's not a polytope. You know, the fact that you have, uh, actually, uh, Nati, I think, uh, there, there is a way to explain why it's not a polytope using this, uh, the, these ideas of uh, Bell inequalities. So th there is a way to, to understand fu functionals and show that there, is no there are no faces in this thing, uh -huh. okay? So in this sense, this is, uh, this is not a polytope. Uh, but, you know, do we know anything about this? I mean, is it defined by what kind of inequality is defined it or? So okay, so, in, uh, okay, so basically of, this is the, the Cyrilson's question. So uh, I, I will get to it, okay, Nati? So uh, okay. maybe it's a bit too soon to okay. say anything more. Uh, Michael, okay, just, so uh, just I, I just want comment. to say before we... Huh? Michael? One yeah. comment. Uh, you mentioned yeah. that you can go beyond this, the correlation beyond this if they'll communicate. There's also non-local uh, correlation that bypasses that. Okay, that... this is also true. Yeah. Um, uh, but not in the models that we will talk about today. Okay, Michal? Like we will talk only about com uh, quantum commuting correlations and even for quantum commuting correlation, the CHSH game is not uh, distinct, does not distinguish between them. I, I, I will get to it anyway. Um, okay, so I think we will uh, have a break in a moment, but just before the break, I want to say that this number, okay, so let me highlight it. This number is interesting, okay? So the maximum over all, uh, the supremum over all, uh, all, all values of a specific game using quantum correlations is an interesting value. So you should think, okay, so if our world is actually governed by quantum mechanics, and this is the correct model for this, uh, and this, this the, is the correct way to describe uh, this world, then uh, this is actually the physical maximum that we can get to, okay? So th this is the best that we can hope for. So understanding this number is interesting by itself, and the set, M the complexity Maybe class MIP fair. star is exactly the, uh, the, the questions that can be uh, answered using approximations of this number. So after the uh, break, I will say it in a more uh, rigorous sense, but uh, I think maybe this is a good point to stop. And if you have questions, I'm still here, but uh, we will take a short break up to five, I think. Great. So um, there were some interesting questions during the recess and I, will stay, say again that we will do a more uh, basic introduction into uh, the tensor product model and entanglement and so on. Uh, but for this specific talk, you don't need to really understand what is the quantum mechanics behind all of this. You just need to believe that there is some model that enables that the boxes to correlate in using this model, okay? So th this is just a mathematical model and you can just believe that they can do this. this. Um, now I want to talk about complexity classes. So up till now, we just, uh, we didn't talk about computer science at all, uh, but now we have something that we can try to approximate. We said that uh, there is this, we have this convex set, a CQ, we have a specific game G, and we can ask what is the supremum over all uh, values of this game using correlations from this set CQ. And this number is called the quantum value of the game. Okay, the supremum is the quantum value of the game. And uh, it's a very natural question to ask whether you can approximate this number. 
Okay, so given a game, okay, uh, so I give you a finite description of the game and I will explain in a moment what do I mean by finite des description because uh, this game consists of a probability distribution and a probability distribution can be one that cannot be described in any finite format. So uh, we need to restrict ourselves to what games actually we, uh, what are the potential inputs to this problem. Um, but given a game that is given in a nice way and given some additive factor epsilon, can you approximate the value of the game, the quantum value of the game up to this additive constant? So this problem is called the Q gap problem. Okay, so uh, if you know how to solve, if you have some uh, method of solving the QCAP problem, you can solve the following uh, set of problems uh, that is called MIP star. So this is the class of all decision problems that can be reduced to the question of whether the value of a specific game is larger or equal to two thirds, or the value of this game is smaller or equal to uh, one third. The specific constants here are not so important, but uh, you can change them a bit, but let's focus on this case. Michael, so if, uh, oh, Michael uh, oh, you know, usually yes. when you have an uh, approximation problem for something quantitative, you either ask about uh, additive uh, approximation like you ask here, and but often you ask about uh, multiplicative up to a factor of one plus minus epsilon. Is there a reason? Why we're asking here the additive? Somehow the second. Mm, the I'm not sure about the stand, the stand Alex, the Nati, I'm not sure about uh, whether prior to this result, uh, people knew whether this, these are the same or different. But uh, now, after MIP star is equal to RE, you, you know that these are the same question. This is the same question. I see. Thanks. Uh, I think. So yeah. can you can you remind what a game is? Is a game of a game is a finite information because for relax. okay. So let's let's say how okay. So let's give an example of uh, okay. So a specific way of uh, input to this problem. Okay. So uh, I need to tell you how to describe a game. So you can give me the size of I A, the size of I B, and I will talk uh, also. Probably there are people here who don't remember complexity theory. So I'll also remind you what the decision problem is in a moment. But what is the input to this problem? So let's think of the following. The size of IA, the size of IB, the size of OA, the size of OB. And now uh, assume that you have some Turing machine that for any tuple uh, from uh, IA times a IB, so the input to this Turing machine uh, is uh, a name of a vertex in of a point in IA and then a name of a point from IB. And this Turing machine needs to output a, a, the probability of a, the input. Okay, so this is a, a way of describing mu. Okay, this is a finite way of describing mu. And you can take, okay, so the, the mu part is the most cryptic part. So I, I will not. Uh, uh, give too much uh, attention to the mu part, uh, but the v part is the same. So and now I want to uh, generate a function. So again, I, I, I defined it using a Turing machine. So uh, you take IA times IB times OA times OB, and you want to output whether it's a zero or one. So you can think of it as a circuit or as a Turing machine, um, but there is some restriction on this Turing machine. So here I wrote polytime, this is a bit misleading also because polytime in what? Um, so uh, as it's written here, it's just a Turing machine, nothing uniform here. There's no polytime to be relative to. But uh, when you think of MIP star, you have an input, you have a decision problem and this decision problem has an input and uh, you translate this input into a game and this game, the, the, the winning predicate in this game should run in polytime the input to the decision problem that I started with. So at least in uh, the so MIP say, star say case- Say this again, the, say this last sentence again. The, yeah, that, okay. So uh, maybe let me uh, just say what the decision problem is and then what I'm saying just now will make but, sense for those but who- another, not, another thing is that mu is, it gives you a value in the reals, right? 
Yeah, okay, so uh, ex- actually, if you give me a Turing machine, it will not give me values in the reads, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. So th- these are not all possible games. Ah, okay, okay. Right, so I have a continuum. I don't, I don't understand all these complications of why do we go into them at all? Why can't I just have a table uh, of IA by IB and there are numbers in there? These are the values of mu. Yeah, this is and good. Uh, table, this uh, this is not good. Nati, this, this is, is too good. good. This, this, too, this is too large. This is too large. This is not the definition of MIP star. This is the problem. Like, no, no, I understand. Uh, but why, why don't we? I mean, this would be, for me, the most obvious way to describe mu by a matrix. How and but the, this is not the way you think of, of multiprover interactive proofs. The way you think of multiprover interactive proofs is that you get a decision problem. The uh, verifier wants to translate it into a game. And the description of this game should be only a polynomial in the size of the problem that we started with. And maybe the table that you talk about is too large, the, but the table can be exponential. Um, I, I have a question. That is the, uh, the, the game that you describe here is, is only one round always? Okay, so we started, I defined only two, two players, one round games. Okay, so I, okay. this is the only definition okay. I gave here. Okay, so also, also in this uh, MIP star definition, it's a one round game. Uh, you are correct that the, the actual definition of MIP star is for any number of players and any number of rounds, but uh, for this talk, I'm only looking at MIP star 2 1. So actually, what I'm defining here is what's called MIP star 2 1. I see. Okay, thanks. So okay, but uh, again, I, you, you're taking me, uh, let me just say something that is important for those of you who don't know complexity uh, theory enough uh, and need some, re- or, or either you need some reminder. So um, a decision problem is just a subset of the natural numbers, okay? And the decision problem is whether a specific number is in this set or is outside this set. And uh, there are questions about how complicated are these sets. So uh, the, the more complicated this A, maybe it's, the harder it is to uh, check whether a number is in this uh, set or is not. Now, um, you should think of uh, MIP star as the following. So given such a problem, so given such a subset of natural numbers, you want for any natural number to generate some gain. G of X. And the point is that your input is X. The size of the input is log base two of X. This is the size of the input. And you now need to generate for me a game, okay? In some polynomial time, okay? With the following property. Either this game has value, quantum value greater or equal to two thirds, or this game has quantum value smaller or equal to one third. And if this is the case, this X does belong to A. And if this is the case, this X does not belong to A. Okay, so this is the kind of thing we want. We want some description, some method to translate any natural number into some into a description of a game where the description of the game is not too large. This is an important point, And this is why I use the term that polytime Turing machines. And uh, we want a relation between the value of the game and whether this element is inside the set or not. So the important part is that this takes polynomial time. This is what I tried to say. This so takes polynomial it time. As, isn't it the same as saying that uh, reduction itself is polynomial? While the description, uh, you can yeah. say the description or whatever, but, but yeah, the reduction is the one. It's the one. same. Uh, okay, I don't know. I, this is the way I think of it. Uh, it's, I, it's a bit, still... Michelle, it's a bit confusing because you're sort of combining the notion of reduction or a complete problem for the class with with the way, with a sort of stand, a straightforward way to think of MIP star, which is just you're given a game and you want to know if its value is larger than two thirds or smaller than one third. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I understand what you, you are saying now. Um, but the, okay, so, but what, okay. But still in your case, Dorit, I want to, to 
just say something about what you just said. I need to tell you something about the way the game is given to me. This is important right. because, for example, I can, can give you the game in a very succinct way. So we will talk to, today about the, the succinct free col colorability problem. And uh, you can think of the succinct uh, game problem. So I give you the game using some circuit, which is very succinct. And now tell me whether the value of this game. So I don't give you an actual description of the game. I give you something much smaller. Right, but you, so, in any but, case, even in your description in, that includes the reduction, you still have to say how you're given the game. Yeah, this is true. But now I'm, I'm uh, giving you, uh, I, I, at least in my opinion, a more, uh, uh, for, for me, it's much clearer. So I give you a natural number. You need to generate this game in some uh, in some uh, reasonable amount of time, and the game need to has have the value uh, according to whether uh, this is a yes uh, answer or a no answer to your decision problem. Yeah, maybe maybe um, a more succinct way of saying this is that you're basically given a family of games parameterize with some index and everything in the in the end game needs to be polynomial in that end. Yeah, right. Okay, this is a good way of describing let me, this. Let Thank me you. say something that may help those of us who are not completely at home with complexity theory. Usually when you ask a decision problem, here is a graph, is it uh, three colorable or not, or something like this, we don't even have to specify. We understand how, how graphs are described or given an integer and, and so on. But in this question that, that Michael posed, this, this uh, value of, of a grain, it's not entirely obvious how, how, the, the, how the input is given to us. And that's why we have to be much more specific about this and it cannot be completely, you know, played. Uh, yeah, in. okay, so oh, you are right. But even in the coloring problem, Nati, I will talk today about the case where you're not getting the adjacency matrix of the graph. You get some smaller thing. Okay, and, and then, then you specify, it. then you specify. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, when, when I say in a class, in, in a basic complexity class, you know, that graph coloring is NP complete, everyone understands the input is a graph in the start way that we give graphs, and that's the question. But when things become more subtle, you have to be more specific about how input is described and so on and so forth. Yeah, so this is what I tried to do here, because when you first look about this problem, you ask, wait, but what, what is the exact input? And, uh, and if the exact input is given in the way you gave it, uh, Nati, a priori, uh, this is not the, the original definition of MIP star. If you give me the table, the whole table of, of V, it's too large. Uh, this, this was my point, uh, actually. Okay, so let me uh, move along. Uh, now the question is, what are the problems in MIP star? So this is, as uh, Dorit said, uh, the complete problem of MIP star defining, uh, deciding whether uh, the value of the game is greater or equal to two thirds or smaller or equal to one third. And what problems are, can be reduced to this problem. So for example, are all uh, polynomial time, uh, all problems that can be verified using a polynomial time Turing machine and on deterministic polynomial time Turing machine and exponential time Turing machine and on deterministic exponential time Turing machine and so on, are all computer powers uh, so uh, problems is it, inside is it obvious, MIP is star. It but is it easy to show that it is contained in RE? We will talk about it in a moment. So this, this is not obvious by itself. You're, okay. Uh, okay, it is obvious, but we need to say it. Okay. Uh, I will talk about why it, it at least, we have some upper bound on MIP star to one and it is RE. Uh, do you see my screen moving? Yeah, great, but uh, I jumped I automatically jump to the MIP star case and there is the classical uh, uh, analog of this thing. And actually this was defined much earlier than the quantum analog. So given a game, again, the same description of the game, uh, can you approx approximate the classical value? So uh, the exact classical value is just the supremum over all classical correlations. And again, this is a problem. So we call this the SIGAP problem and MIP is the class of all decision problem reduced to this specific problem with the classical value instead of the uh, quantum value. And as opposed to the previous question when where upper bounds are quite hard to, uh, to deduce, here it's quite easy to deduce some upper bounds. So as we said before, the uh, classical correlations are just a convex hull of some finite number of correlations. 
And since the value of the game is a linear functional, the maximum uh, is achieved by a vertex. So we just need to go over all the vertices. And I wrote here that if you do this, you get a doubly exponential sized uh, thing. So this takes doubly exponential time. Why doubly exponential? Exactly because the input of the game was the size of IA, the size of IB, the size of OA, the size of OB, and so on, okay? And uh, it means that you can give me an input of some size and the sizes of these sets can be exponential. And then the number of correlations that you need to check, to check is doubly exponential. Okay, so this is where the double exponential comes from. The fact that the input can be much smaller than the actual sizes of the, uh, the sets that we need to check. Um, and the, there is a question whether, there are two natural questions now. So we have this MIP, we uh, understand that uh, we have some reasonable upper bound because we have some size of set that we need to check the value for which and checking the value, we assume that it's uh, quite efficient. So uh, this shouldn't be too hard to calculate this, uh, uh, this case, but maybe there's a better upper bound. So usually when you have a P and then uh, like an NP problem, uh, you ask yourself if I was given a, an actual proof, whether it would make my life easier. And uh, the answer is yes, right? So if someone is actually giving me uh, the, the specific uh, vertex that I should use to check whether uh, this is a yes instance or a no instance. If it is a yes instance, I will be, uh, I will understand that it is a yes instance. And if there is, it is a no instance, I will not be uh, fooled by the prover. So this is why you should automatically uh, uh, understand why MIP is inside non-deterministic exponential uh, time. Okay, so given an exponential proof, I can verify it. Uh, uh, and check whether this is a yes instance or a no instance. Uh, and it turns out in uh, 1991, Babai, Fortno, and Lund proved that this is also a lower bound for MIP. So any question that lives in non-deterministic exponential time uh, can be reduced to uh, MIP. Uh, to this uh, value, the classical value of the gain, to deciding the classical value of the gain. And the, the complete problem to uh, NX is the succinct free colorability problem. So I want to briefly talk about the succinct free colorability problem because uh, it's a nice problem. So as we uh, mentioned beforehand, uh, when Nati talks about NP problems in first co complexity class, he just says you get a graph and you need to, cho to check whether it's three colorable. So now the input uh, is going to be given in the following way, okay? So now I'm giving you a graph, a graph G, but I'm coding, encoding it in the following way. I tell you the number of vertices in the graph a number of vertices. Okay, maybe let's write it this way. That's two to the N. Okay, so this is an input of size N, right? The size uh, of this thing. It's a, this is an input of size N. This is the number of vertices. And I also give you a circuit. So a Boolean circuit. Boolean circuit. I hope I write circuit correctly. Okay, so this is a, and now you get a Boolean circuit. So the input is two to the N and some C. And what is this C? This C is, uh, has two N inputs. Okay, so here are N inputs. Here are another N inputs. And I think of these inputs as two names of vertices. Okay, so each vertex has a name whose length is also, so you, you take a, a sequence of n bits, it describes a single vertex in this graph. And uh, for example, I don't know, zero, one, so on, one, and one, zero, zero, zero. Great, so I have to uh, 
two, in, uh, two N inputs. And then I take some of the inputs and I do Boolean logic. So I uh, do either an, an OR or uh, uh, an AND or negation of these things. So I do these things and I get a single output. The point is that you get a single output, which is either a zero or a one. And I interpret this output as whether these two vertices are connected or these two vertices are not connected. Okay, so this is a description of a graph. I need to tell you something about the size of this Boolean circuit. And the point is that the size of the Boolean circuit is bounded by some polynomial in N. So you choose a polynomial beforehand and you say that all your circuits are, are bounded by uh, this polynomial, okay? Uh, do you agree that this is a description of a graph? You don't describe all graphs this way. So this is a, a, a way of describing just a very small part of the graphs, of possible graphs. Um, but, okay, with a specific size of uh, set size. Negligible. Um, a negligible fraction of the graph. Yeah, negligible. But uh, it turns out that actually this is the complete problem. Asking whether such a graph is three colorable is a complete problem for the set of all uh, non-deterministic exponential time problems. Uh, Michael, maybe you said so and I missed it, but it's a small fraction of the graphs if, the, if you bound the size of the circuit. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm saying. I'm, I am, uh, I yeah, am, bounding, I I am bounding the size of the circuit. The circuit is polynomial size. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In M. And uh, okay. Um, okay. Anyway, this is so. The just to be problem. precise, how do you how do you code the circuit as a when you said the, the circuit is polynomial? What do you mean by that? Okay, so you first take the uh, you just uh, say that there are two n inputs. This is the first thing you need to say, and then you just uh, um, I need to tell you which like what operations you need to do, it's right? A it's a graph, it's a directed graph with gates uh, that are added with the gates. Not. Yeah. You just. Ah, uh, so the number of gates. The, is the point is that the, the, this, this description can yes. be polynomial. This is the point, okay? Okay. The, the description of such thing can be polynomial and polynomial. very efficient. Uh, it is polynomial, okay? So we just take them to be polynomial. And, uh, and then the graph is much larger. So uh, the, the graph is much larger than. Uh, uh, than the circuit or the than the input. This is the point. Okay, so we have this problem. Given a graph in this way, uh, t telling us whether it's three colorable or not. And what uh, Babai, Fortnow, and Lund uh, did is that they were able to take this circuit. Okay, so this circuit already have this information, right? So uh, in some sense. Uh, this is a redundant information. So they were able to take uh, the circuit, translate it into a game. And this game had a value, actually value one, classical value one, if it is three colorable. And this game had value, I think bounded away from one half if it is not three colorable. Okay, so I'm not sure about this, this, the soundness constant, but uh, the completeness constant was, uh, is one. And uh, actually this is a, a precursor to the PCP theorem in some sense. You can uh, interpret this thing as some PCP with log a logarithmic number of queries. And uh, I don't remember the, the size of the, of the randomness that you need, but uh, this is a precursor to, uh, to the PCP theorem. And we will talk about the PCP theorem throughout this seminar. This will be an important part of this seminar. And uh, they used uh, polynomials over finite fields. So the way you solve this problem is that for any circuit, you define a, a polynomial over a finite field and a, the way that you should think of proving me that, like what, what I expect the provers to do is uh, to actually color the graph, right? So any coloring of the graph is also a polynomial. And these co polynomials correspond in some sense 
uh, to one another if this is a, a legitimate three coloring of the graph and they correspond to one another in a different way if this is not a three coloring of the graph. And then you can just check if you have a, a polynomial over a, a finite field, maybe the, uh, you can just restrict yourself. So a polynomial uh, is from this finite field to some N to uh, the finite field. Okay, so I assume that N, M, N is not good here. Okay, so this is R, I don't know. You have R inputs. Uh, this is the number of variables in your polynomial. Uh, you can just take subspaces of, uh, of smaller dimension and check the behavior of this polynomial uh, only on subspaces, on two dimensional subspaces and zero dimensional subspaces. So planes and uh, points. And in some sense, you play this game of evaluating these polynomials over sets of points and planes and uh, somehow uh, this is a game that actually distinguishes between the three colorable graphs and the non three colorable graphs. Okay, so this was a very uh, broad overview. I just wanted to uh, give you the feeling of what is the way things are done here. So the, the, this is already a very deep result. So the fact that MIP is equal to any uh, to next is already a very deep result. And uh, this translation requires some heavy machinery. Okay, cool. I, I'm, we will uh, uh, do a few lectures about PCPs and then like, like the quantum case where I tell you that uh, probably uh, when we talk about it now, it's just filling the, the ground. Um, uh, we'll do a more uh, deep discussion about all of this uh, later on. Okay, so let me just move along. Uh, there is a problem. Uh, it is quite clear that the value, the quantum value of the game uh, is strictly larger of a specific game, is strictly larger than the classical value of a game. And this helps you in the uh, completeness part. So we said that uh, we have a game, we want to decide whether its value is greater or equal to two thirds or its value is uh, smaller or equal to one third. So if you take the same game and you, uh, allow the players to play with quantum uh, correlations, this cannot be hurt. Uh, this stays the same, right? Uh, they, they have only more power. So they, the, the value can only, if I change from the quantum to the classical case, this uh, part can only get, get better. The problem is exactly like in the CHSH game, what happens if uh, the value is strictly smaller, the classical value is smaller than one third and you cannot automatically uh, deduce that the quantum value is smaller or equal to one third. This is just not true in some cases. And this is why even to decide whether MIP star is stronger than MIP is a difficult question because you should ask yourself whether, uh, for example, the, uh, the work of Babai, Fortnow and Loon just goes to uh, the quantum case. And, uh, Okay, so you can, you can ask yourself, can I do the same reduction and get the fact that also the succinct three colorability problem is in MIP style. And it turns out that with, at least with two players, it was not known, uh, but with three players, it is true. And this is a result of Ito and Vidic, uh, Ito and Vidic from 2012, they, uh, show that if you take three players and before the game, before you send them their questions, you randomly choose two of them and play the game with these two players, then actually this reduction stays uh, true. So you still, you can use the quantum value instead of the classical value and you still prove the succinct three colorability problem. Okay, so this proves that uh, NEXP lives inside MIP star and uh, specifically that MIP, because it, it is equal to next, lives inside MIP star. Okay, so uh, it seems but like- But you mean, uh, but wait, MIP star for you now is more than two players? Yeah, okay, okay, so you're right. I, this is MIP star three one. MIP star is the union of all MIP and K, okay? Actually, but uh, the, 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 the new result 
is that MIP star 2-1 is equal to RE, okay? I'm getting to it, but here you are right, they didn't show that NX is, lives inside MIP star 2-1, they show that it lives in MIP star 3-1, so you play oh, the Nikol, game with three players. What's the second parameter? The first parameter is how many players, and the second? What, how many rounds? Oh, okay, thanks. So it's a single round three player game. And the, the, the point is that the only, the only part where you use three players is that you take two of them randomly and play the game with them, which is quite amazing. So, uh, this is because of something in quantum mechanics called the monogamy theorem or something like that. I'm not sure that uh, I can say anything more, but we will probably talk about this part as well. So we need Ito and Vidic's work uh, to understand MIP star is equal to Ari. Okay, great. So um, this is the reduction and this was this one uh, best paper in the conference it was uh, introduced in, so this was a very big deal. Um, and actually, Dorit is here, and uh, Vidic wrote some uh, uh, blog post about the history of this question, and he uh, says that uh, Dorit then asked them after they've done this work whether they know something about QMA, uh, which is, if I'm correct, the quantum analog of NP in some sense, right? Um, and they thought that they finished they show that MIP lives inside MIP star. They thought that probably the other way around will be shown uh, soon after. Uh, and Vidic says that after Dorit asked her question, they started to work on this as well. And this was achieved by Natarajan and Vidic. So Natarajan, uh, maybe I'll go to the next paper. So bounds for MIP star. And so Natarajan and Vidic, Natarajan, Vidic, show that QMA lives inside MIP star as well. Okay, and this was actually an MIP star 7-1, uh, or maybe maybe this is not one, I need to check, but MIP 7 something. Again, okay, what, so is, a seven, what is Q, seven QMA? Player game. What is QMA again? Uh, le let's not uh, talk about what's QMA. So again, this is a potentially... Uh, this is the quantum analog of NP. Okay, so quantum analog of NP, this, this is what we will say for now. Um, but this was very interesting. So in some sense, this question motivated them to keep on going and <laughs> studying this uh, uh, thing. Okay, probably they would have studied it anyway, but uh, this, this is a good motivation, a specific question. What happens with QMA? And uh, about two years or two or three years after that, uh, it was shown by Natarajan, and this is uh, 2000, I think, 16, 17, and this is 2019, Natarajan, Natarajan, and right, prove that actually you can do uh, the following, you can show that uh, non-deterministic doubly exponential time lives inside MIP star, and here this is 2-1. Okay, so there is a two-player uh, one-round reduction to any problem that is uh, in N double E XP, NIXP. And the problems here are just, instead of giving me a circuit, give me a circuit that produces a circuit that produces the graph. And then decide whether this graph is free colorable. So you just take a circuit, you can define it using a smaller circuit, and this large circuit defines a very large graph. So this is the complete problem for NIXP, and they proved that actually uh, this lives inside MIP star to one. Uh, I will say some caveats about this proof. Uh, just, because... just to make sure, again, for non-experts, is this clearly, except for the two and the, this is, this is clearly, NIXP contains QMA, right? Just to make sure. Dorit? I'm not sure. Dorit? Um, I think so. Dorit, I'm to um, to QMA is all QMA is in P space and yeah. non-deterministic double expansion ah. in P space. Yeah. Yeah. Contains yeah. QMA, right? That's what you QMA. asked? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. We need some zookeeper here for the... Uh, yes. And 
Okay, so when Natarajan and Wright... Michael, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of I'm confused. Are you sure that the first result that you were talking about is just about QMA or is it QMA EXP? Uh, I think it's QMA. Uh, this is the name, they call it the, P the, the quantum PCP for games or something, the proof for the... Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm asking about the scaling the, of the sizes of the questions and answers on both sides. Yeah, you mean that maybe QMA is trivial when you have next? Uh, okay, I need, uh, I, I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, I'm not, okay. Yeah, may, maybe this is trivial, you need some other, uh, like X here, but... Uh, you need the scaling up, I, I think, but I'm not sure. Maybe, okay, so maybe this uh, thing I will... But the point is that some important, uh, my point was that some important... Uh, developments were shown in this work uh, and, and they enabled also this uh, uh, result. And uh, when you have two E's, you start to ask yourself whether you can uh, increase it to three E's and four E's and five E's and so on. And the main, uh, you can say that the main uh, contribution of MIP star is equal to RE is in some sense, uh, a, designing a way of iteratively doing uh, the, so what actually they do in the next result is they take some, uh, the next reduction and somehow translate it to a next reduction. Okay, so they take the exponential case and they uh, somehow uh, uh, construct from it using uh, something called self-testing and answer reduction. So they use PCPs and they use uh, something that is clearly quantum, uh, uh, quantum behaviors called self-testing uh, and they achieve it next reduction. And then the, the natural question is why can't you do it iteratively? So they couldn't do it iteratively, Natarajan and Wright, but the result of MIP star is equal to E is exactly saying that you can do, uh, you can design this process such that you can do it iteratively. So then you can solve Nix with three E's and then with four E's and so on. And actually uh, you can solve the halting problem. So it's quite amazing, but uh, since you know all of this, you can show that the halting problem uh, lives inside MIP star. Okay. And I want to quickly go back to uh, what I wrote here. So I said that uh, it was shown by Navascus, Pironio, and the Sin that Cyrilson's problem implies that uh, MIP star lives inside R, which means that the halting problem cannot sit inside MIP star. So the fact that they show that actually the halting problem sits inside MIP star implies that this is not true, implies that this is not true. And thus that cons embedding problem, what, what's not true? I, I didn't say what the conjecture is, but uh, Cyrilson pro uh, problem uh, was shown to be uh, a strict inequality, if you know what it means. And since we, are, we ran out, out of time, next time I'll start by stating what Cyrilson problem is. But what is R? What is R? Uh, computable problems. So all problems that you can uh, decide using uh, a Turing machine, whether all A's inside N, such that there exists some Turing machines, such that for any input uh, will output at some point, whether this number is inside this set or outside this set. With so no time, with no, with no time restrictions. R is the class of decidable problems. Yeah. So, so just okay. the last sentence, so, so how, how do you get that the, that uh, the implication from the right to the middle. So what did you say? The f uh, okay, so you have an, an implication from the left to the, to, from the middle to the right, right? Yeah. But they negated this. This is just not true. They show that this is equal to RE, which is strictly who, who, larger. Who is they? Oh, now and you mean the new home? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, G, I so R, tell so the RE so G, is strictly... Fidik, right, you went. So, R, but R E is strictly less than R. Strictly bigger. R, R. R is strictly R is strictly smaller than R E. Yeah. 
You what show that RE? MIP star is too large. I don't understand, but you say that, that MIP star is equal to RE. And RE MIP is strictly, wait. which is strictly larger than R. R what is, is RE? Set, wait, sorry, wait, wait, wait. MIP R star contained in R is just a conjecture. It's not true. Yeah, yeah, this was the conjecture. And this What's was the conjecture. What's here is just a conjecture, which is false. Exactly. Okay, which means that what? The, and, and do you have the converse? R is inside the, what yes. about ah, the yeah. R, R lives inside RE in a strict way. So R is strictly smaller than RE. What is, so what, so what is, what's the original definition of RE before we know that wait, it's equal? Wait, wait, wait. So can I say R is the set of decidable problems. It's, it's the, you know, the recursive problems. Uh, RE is the set of recursively enumerable problems. Uh, should I explain what this means, if anyone sure, wants? Sure, sure, sure. Speak, speak up. Yes. So recursively enumerable problems are, you know, it's decision problems. Uh, for problems in R, you can just take an input, run a tool machine, and it will tell you if the answer is yes or no. Recursive enumerable problems, you don't necessarily have a tool machine that will tell you yes or no. Instead, you have a Turing machine that just runs continuously and outputs a, a various Xs, and eventually it will output all Xs for which the answer is yes. So it can, or another way to say it is that if the, uh, you, know, you have a language, if yeah. X is in the language, the Turing machine will say yes eventually. If it's not in the language, the so R E is strictly lighter than R. This is a classical result. Yeah, yeah, that's that, good. That's, 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 that's a textbook. Right? This is a textbook that's, result. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's two way to get the yes. What yes, goes right, back yes. to the thirties? Right. So, so and now, now Cyrilson's conjecture was some equality that implied that M I P star is contained in R. Mm -hmm. exactly. But the new result shows that actually RE is contained in MIP star. And RE is strictly bigger than R, so it refuted the conjecture on the right hand side. Right. MIP cannot With be inside R if it is. So we say it again that R is strictly contained, but what about yes. the connection? Yes. Yeah. It's strictly R contained R in MIP star. R is a R proper subset of RE. And it's uh, easy to see that it's a that it's a subset of MIP. Yeah, yeah, please, MIP star. Okay, so I, no. I didn't say it. No, no it's no, extremely hard. Just a moment. R and that's very easy. That we do in a basic. No, I understand. But what the connection between R, R and star MIP R. star? What's R, R, R is R is strictly contained in R E. And the, the fact that it's is, contained is easy. Yes. Contained in easy, uh, is easy, strictly contained is also extremely classical, no, classical result, not classical physics, just it's, it's a classical result that R is strictly contained in RE. Yeah, and the new cool. result is that RE, this huge class, is contained in MIP star. Equals. Okay, so Equals. the point that, the, the other way around, I just want, before we go home, I just want to say that this inclusion uh, is not so hard. And the way you should think of it is as follows. You have this, this uh, set CQ. Okay, let me go back to the set CQ. Okay, so we have this set CQ. You can approximate this set uh, using an epsilon for any given dimension that you choose. So, you can say, okay, so let's take all, uh, all strategies. So these experiments together with this Psi, I call it a strategy. So you can take all these strategies and just take, uh, there is a continuum of them, but you can just take an epsilon net inside this continuum of uh, things. And then you move to, okay, so you start from two dimensional strategies and then you go for three dimensional strategies and four dimensional strategies. And in this way, you get a sequence of numbers, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, that tends, that goes, it is non-decreasing, so it goes up and it uh, gets to the value of the game. So you just take for any, you take a sequence of smaller and smaller epsilon 
and a sequence of larger and larger dimensions. For any epsilon and dimension, you take a, an, a, an epsilon net inside this dimension, and this approximates from below the quantum value of every gain. This means that if you, at some point, one of the numbers in this sequence is strictly larger than one third, you can automatically say that this is a yes instance of your uh, decision problem. So this means that deciding the yes instance is computable. The only question is why deciding the no instance is not computable. And this is what we are going to talk about, okay? So uh, this is important. Okay. Yeah. This I is the inclusion in Ali. Yeah, great. Uh, so uh, I'm staying here, but I think we, we finished at least the formal part of the Okay, the talk, see you okay? in a week, minus two hours, right? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, wait, maybe we will change the time slot, so be careful. I, th I think there is, it, with this uh, amount of participation, I think there is zero chance to hopeless, change the hopeless. time. Uh, uh, you're maybe in right. two or three meetings, there will be uh, <laughs> few <laughs> enough people to... Pro yeah, probably of reduction, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks, Litrot. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye. So I'm staying. Those of you who want to stay with me, Thanks. I'm here. Bye. Bye yes. for all of those who... So Michael, you mentioned that uh, whenever you do another iteration of another e in the nx, and then mm -hmm. you, they, they have in this iterative process. So in this iterative process, in the when they show the inclusion in the MIP star, so there were those two parameters, number of players and iteration. It stays. It stays to one. 